Welcome to the Direct Platform Geeks webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Today we have Steph Locky, and she will be doing a webinar on R for developers. Before we start the webinar, I would like to quickly go through a few slides about Data Platform Geeks. It's a subsidiary and a community initiative by eDomino Solutions, who also have companies like SQL Maestro's, Pipula India, who specialize in training on SQL Server and other technologies, Pan India, and also online. Please do explore their sites for more information. Data Platform Summit, the fourth year of this conference, has been announced. It's on it's uh, a three-day conference happening from 9th to 11th of August. And there are two pre-conference training days on 7th and 8th of August. This is happening in Hotel Radisson Blue in Bangalore, formerly Hotel Park Plaza. This is a three-day pure learning event. There's no marketing involved. And we have two pre-conference training days, which is a full day event on a deep technical topic. We have seven tracks at this conference, more than 100 sessions and more than 50 speakers worldwide renowned speakers and uh, product team members from Microsoft Redmond, MVPs, MCMs, you name them, they are there at this conference. So it will be a good opportunity for you to network with them and learn from the experts and also interact with them and learn from your peers. Please visit dps10.com for more information on this uh, about this conference. Let me quickly introduce you to the core team of Data Platform Geeks. Amit Bansal, he's the founder and president right now. I'm myself, I'm Anahur Puna. I'm the vice president of Data Platform Geeks. Avnish Panchal, Prince Rastogi, Sandeep Pani, and Subhi Agarwal hold various uh, positions in the core team and handle, handle all the operations that are related to, related to this community. Edomna teams are the backbone of this community. They help us run these events and um, bring these events to the community. A special thanks to Microsoft who has been a great support and help us run this community and build this community. If you are attending this webinar today, you would have already registered on dataplatformgeeks.com. This is completely free and you get access to all the free content on the site. Like we have uh, blogs, free videos, labs and magazines. And you can also share what you want to see on this site and we will be able to try and get some resources onto the site. And also join the largest SQL group on Facebook. It's the SQL Geeks, the Data Platform Geeks official Facebook group, and also the LinkedIn group, where you can post your questions and you get expert advice on your questions. You can also answer some questions if you're really interested. Without any further delay, I would like to hand over to our speaker today. Over to you, Steph. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for uh, coming along today. So just a heads up, you might hear some background noise. I'm currently in a lounge in, um, in Amsterdam in between flights. So I'm gonna switch over to my screen and start the presentation. Okay, so today's talk is R for developers. Uh, I'm assuming most of you have a developer background, but this will broadly apply to people who write SQL, who do BI, but it is definitely aimed at desk. So we're going to be using words like object-oriented programming to draw parallels between things. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to look at what R is, the different ways you can code in it, uh, some really useful, some things that R is really great at, uh, and then how you can uh, consume sources with R and then work with R to consume other sources. Uh, so, hopefully, it'll give you a broad overview of where and when and how you might use R. It's not going to teach you R, but it'll give you the right places to go to learn more and drill into the specific areas that you need. Okay. So uh, first thing we're going to do is going to look at the different ways you can code in the R language. 
So R is an open source uh, package, a uh, programming language. It's built to be initially backwards compatible with a language called S, which is about 40, 50 years old now. Uh, so some of the original code is pretty quirky, but there's been a lot of recent developments in the last five years that add things like functional programming to vastly improve the interface to make uh, R much easier to learn and utilize. Uh, one of the key limitations that you'll need to think about with R is that it is an in-memory application by default. So uh, on my 16 gigabyte machine, I'm able to quite comfortably store and operate on about 40, 50 million rows, as long as the table isn't too wide. If you're needing to process a lot more data than that, then you might want to consider running on a server and or with the Microsoft machine learning server capabilities. So in terms of how you can code with R, so once you've opened up the executable, usually in our studio or visual studio, and you write some code, there's some different ways you can write that code. By default, R is uh, set based. So if you know how to write SQL and you get like column A times column B uh, and you get one row per um, one resulting row per row, you get the basics of how R is written. Uh, it is notionally object oriented by default uh, and we'll see some of that but there is uh, some much stronger object-oriented uh, libraries out there that help us do something closer to true OO programming. And an area that has made uh, huge inroads into the R community is functional programming. So uh, most commonly, the, it's effectively data pipelines. So we're starting with um, a data set, a table, or something, and doing uh, changes functionally instead of um, with a method based approach or a sort of wholly procedural approach. And we'll see both of the, uh, both the OO capabilities and the functional programming in just a sec. So, set based is pretty typical. Uh, here in my code snippet, <coughs> I'm creating a variable called A, and that's holding the numbers 1 to 10. And I've got a variable called B holding the number 3, and I can do A times B, and I can get the result of 1 times 3, 2 times 3, and so on. So this is the vector-based approach in R. And you can also see how we do things like storing some data for reuse later. One thing that you're probably wondering uh, is, especially if you're a C-sharp or a SQL dev, is where the heck are my data types? R has data types, but variables do not have any association with them. You can backup, uh, but it took a couple of hours to render this morning, so I haven't had a chance to send it over. But like all good DBAs and data professionals, I have a backup. So if, there, if this it carries on, you won't have lost the webinar. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll continue for some more time. Uh, hopefully the connection gets better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
uh, we can do uh, vector-based operations, no problem. That for a very long time was kind of the, the cool, the, the, the common way that people were doing things in R. Uh, vectors were one type of object. So basically the objects uh, mostly corresponded to uh, data structures. So we had lists for miscellaneous stuff, vectors for one dimensional data, tables, uh, data frames for uh, tables as we think of them. People then added extra uh, object types like time series data, and that's where the object oriented programming kind of came in. So we'd have um, classes or objects of data uh, and we would then take standard functions like print and have specific methods that interacted with objects like data frame to produce a specific action. So some of the available methods for, that apply to data frames include our getters, so dollar is get a column from something and we can see where we have an assign, that's our setters. Uh, so we have various uh, methods that you could take the existing system and extend. Uh, but this is relatively limited and doesn't typically have the sort of um, you know, the initialization and the public functions, the private functions and stuff that people may be expect with object-oriented programming. Uh, so we, they developed a package called R6. Uh, it's a joke, geeky, no need to uh, Google it if you want to. Uh, and this works a lot better. So uh, here I'm loading up the library. R6. So that's like doing an import in Python or a uh, use in C sharp. That's making the extra functionality available to us. And we're making a, we're storing a uh, object type of people. Uh, I was doing it with person, but I got some naming conflicts with an existing object. So it's people. Uh, publicly available, we have some pre-initialized variables and a function, that, a method that people will be able to utilize. And you can see that it adheres to the convention that you'll use when you usually write a little programming of self to refer to. So if we don't get our definition right first time, we can also then go and uh, use set functions to uh, add in extra aspects. So this is creating a method called email, which will turn the first name and last name into an email address. Now that we have set up our uh, ask, we're then able to instantiate a new uh, instance of that called Beth. We can uh, set values for uh, variables that we initialized, and we can then use methods uh, that we created. So this is really useful. Uh, you're having to facilitate um, development by data scientists for something that's a bit robust. So this could be uh, things like doing loan modeling so that you can uh, get cash flows and things like that uh, as an API. You, um, yeah, so th th this is really good when you need to do data intensive, object oriented, uh, data intensive programming that relates to one or more uh, types of uh, uh, So functional programming is where a lot of the our programmers are uh, sort of spending time learning right now. So we have um, 
the Magrata uh, pipe, which uh, the convention for R is to basically either say pipe or then uh, when we're in a data pipeline. We also have a package called dplyr. dplyr is data manipulation and that helps us uh, do some really nifty things that really actually beat SQL too. Uh, so I can't um, Uh, I, I'm not going into it today, but if you want me back for a session on how our text sequels but I'm happy to do that. So in this, uh, typically called the data pipeline, we're starting with our Iris data set, which is a built-in data set in R. There's usually, uh, there's about 30 of them, and they're really useful for learning how to use R and providing uh, minimum reproducible examples. So we take our iris data, then we apply a filter, and we uh, say the species must not be equal to Satosa. Then we take the top 25 records based on sepal width, and then we summarize our data. So these uh, data pipelines, their functional programming in the context of what they do is they technically hurry the function like filter so that the first argument is provided by the previous pipeline uh, row. Um, so we're able to get things in really readable ways that have greatly increased the uh, the comprehensibility, comprehensibility <laughs> of R. Uh, the data pipelines, though, they're not quite maybe what we'll often think about functional programming. So I wanted to show another use case. The package per is to help us do effectively recursion type things. So here we're starting off with a vector. So uh, two words, the toes are in versicolor, and these could represent email addresses or accounts or customers <laughs> or uh, different data sets that you've loaded up. And we're then able to uh, apply functions to each value. So R by default is set based. So it would try, if we, when we add a function, it tries to operate on the whole data set these map functions allow us to basically iterate without iterating through the um, original set of data. And one of the nice things about it is that it also helps us start doing some type enforcement because it's wonderful and absolutely terrible that, we, that we're not working in a type safe map. So this map function is going to apply something to Satosa and then Versicolor and then bring the results back as a vector of integers. And the function that we're doing here is a lambda function. So it doesn't exist outside the scope of this map statement. That's denoted by the um, tilde. And what we're going to do is we're going to do an n row, which is how many rows are there, of the filtered version of iris where the species equals the one that we provided. So we get 50 and 50 back because that's how many rows there are in the iris data set for each of those species. And these uh, things that we map, they could be API calls, they could be document renders, we uh, we can parallelize them with a uh, package called fur uh, and it comes in very handy because now you don't really have to write complicated loops, you write a map statement instead. Uh, one key use case for R uh, that's really quite unexpected I think for most people 
is uh, actually making things to give to others. So R is especially great for online things, and I'm gonna show you uh, some of the areas where it's great and where I'm using it inside my organization. So the first thing is pages like this, right? HTML with uh, maybe some JavaScript, essentially static. So we're able to do this with a package called R Markdown, and we often put our JavaScript things like leaflet maps or D3 uh, graphics in, uh, embedded in them using a package called HTML widgets. So let's have a quick look at how this is constructed behind the scenes. So this packet, uh, this file, rmd, r markdown, has YAML metadata at the top. This can include lots of complicated things like uh, what CSS to include, uh, whether to add tables of contents. Uh, you can even parameterize it to, to allow you to provide uh, different data sets and variables in it. We then have text and uh, it uses the fairly standard markdown syntax that you'll probably be used to with stack overflow. Uh, the bits where it gets nifty is in the, after the three back ticks, which you might be used to for code blocks, where you would often put uh, the language to do syntax highlighting, if you put curly braces around it, R will try and execute that code. And it will execute that code for R, Python, SQL, C++, uh, Spam, and a few more languages. So when I'm talking about this R Markdown stuff, it doesn't just have to be R. We can use R to render things, but actually we can use all of the capabilities with multiple different languages. And it can be a different language every code chunk. Uh, so this will go away and uh, execute these and then print the results. Uh, if we have, if we wanted to show a graph, it will, uh, when we render it, it will include the graph in the HTML. And this makes it really simple to build uh, documents that are very data heavy without having to write lots of um, like JSON arrays to go into JavaScript charts and things. R can handle a lot of that for you because it finds a lot of JavaScript um, data visualization packages like uh, HiCharts, D3, um, Google Viz, uh, and then it has things like the uh, Vega Lite and stuff. So we're able to um, integrate lots of really cool things into this. And then we have a render command that takes this and turns it into a document. And it turns it into the document specified up here or to the type that we provide it. And uh, it can actually go to HTML, PDF, Word, PowerPoint. Um, so we have lots of flexibility there as to what we can produce. Uh, we can make books. So this is pretty cool. I have, um, I've now written two books in our markdown. And for my beta readers, I had this site, so it's a git book. Uh, and it has search. This is how I actually produce um, all of my training materials now. So they have a working interactive online uh, experience, but 
I'm also able to produce PDFs out of it. So, uh, for getting the book published on Amazon, I needed a PDF for print and I needed a pop movie for Kindle. And I'm able to produce all of these things with the same R Markdown files but different uh, render outputs. And all of this, uh, including visualizations, code highlighting, things like that, comes actually just from the same things I'm writing the R for Dev stuff in. So we've got code chunks with some options to configure them and mark them. And to build them and to build all the different versions is um, these different render book steps. So we're able to download to go to EPUB or go to online or go to PDF or even to Word. Uh, so this is a great way of doing um, long materials that you're going to publish on the web or to PDF uh, because the code is right there, you never end up with a graphic that's out of date because you can always just rerun something. So I would totally recommend this if you're having to do anything remotely like publishing. Uh, so R is a really well documented language. We have um, really great help files and some sites which compile these things. So rdrr.io is one such location where we have um, where the information where the documentation is being surfaced. And when we, uh, when we make our functionality, we, give, we should give everything a tagline as to what it does, an extended description. The usage gets automatically generated for us. We provide information on uh, every input, what it should take. We have extra detail, uh, including methods. We say what it should return and if there's been any relevant papers. And um, we also then give you uh, related items. Uh, that one doesn't have it, but almost everything also has uh, some examples. So one great way to learn R is basically copy and paste the examples and hack till it works. And this website allows you to also uh, step in, make some changes and run some code. So you don't even have to have R on your machine to start learning how to, how to write R. So with package down, uh, previously, people would usually rely on the uh, CRAM websites to host effectively documentation. And this is, it's Times New Roman. It looks like it's from the 90s. This is not a pretty uh, site. It does make uh, our PDFs uh, and our web pages of long form documentation we make. But these are still not, um, they're still not particularly nice. So the R package called Package Down allows us to instead do things uh, like this for our packages. 
So this is the Have I Been Cloned package. Uh, we get a nice page, references, articles, and all of this, you can see here, programmatically generates from our code and our documentation. So this documentation gets uh, visible in our studio. We can spin it into websites and it's also in source control in a reader book. So none of this is things that I had to write extra. The only thing that I needed to go through was set up this uh, YAML metadata file. I have a bespoke template and I set some stuff up and make uh, static files and I'm able to publish those. Super easy, helps make uh, any of the stuff that you're producing for consumption look 10 times better. We can also make websites more generally. So I'm a big fan of Hugo, the static site generator. Um, so uh, my homepage is a pure Hugo uh, installation. So this is static and uh, uses like JavaScript here and things. And so on. So this is built in Hugo, but we Hugo can also be used for blogs. And uh, we have an R package called Blogdown that helps us take these RMDs, which are uh, intended to be very data driven, and convert them into a blog site. So, for instance, um, here was one I wrote. That. That's good formatting. I think I need to fix those. I think not everything's loading up properly right now. So we're able to do things that uh, get run and tested and produce outputs. Um, and we write these in Markdown and we convert them with a package called Blogdown. So then we're able to have uh, in this nice simple Hugo content directory we have markdown files, uh, so it's really easy to import a WordPress blog, for instance. And then we end up with um, RMDs, which are the uh, pre-rendered versions. And then once we've uh, prepared it, it inserts the results for showcasing. So Blogdown is a fantastic way to integrate SQL, working SQL hyphen and R into a blog site. And um, I have, uh, it works really nice in continuous integration and deployment environment. So a lot of us in the R world are using Netlify at the moment. Uh, very cool system. Uh, hooks up really easily to get. And my uh, site, uh, it's a lot behind the scenes. has a team of us working on different bits and pieces. And I do apologize for my internet. Uh, 
uh, typical deployments are 47 seconds. So my entire website, which includes uh, a whole bunch of areas, I'll show you the build script. So we make sure we have all the files, we build four different areas of the site, we include package down documents, so we have effectively four block down areas, four package down areas, we do some reveal JS for slides, and we'll, I'll show you this reveal JS stuff shortly, uh, and we're also hosting those. So in 47 seconds, we're rendering a, uh, something like 200 blog posts, whole raft of calendars and interactive stuff, uh, package documentation, and slide decks. So R, our markdown, uh, combined with Git and great platforms like Netlify really allow us to build something super cool with very limited HTML and CSS work. And then on the uh, presentations front, these again are very, very similar to the R Markdown uh, that we've seen today. And the only real difference is that the JavaScript library that it references in the HTML is a um, is the reveal JS library. Um, uh, now you never ever need to worry about bullet points in a PowerPoint presentation because Markdown will sort that for you. Uh, another area where R helps you build um, cool things with a minimum of code is around dashboards. So the package Flex dashboard allows us to do um, uh, basically simple job, uh, very good looking uh, HTML, CSS and JavaScript dashboards. And we can incorporate Shiny, which is another R package for doing uh, server-side R programming. Uh, so here is one app that <coughs> I built to remind myself not to go to Starbucks too often. Uh, and what would happen if instead of frittering my money away on venti frappes, what I get in my pension pot at the end of uh, retire, uh, when I retire. So this has uh, some nice sliders to help people um, adjust the data. And then we get values like a number of copies, the amount invested, and you probably recognize the font or some icons and the top charts and things. And now people can say, okay, well, I buy 10 copies, or 12 copies. So I buy copies, two copies, six days a week. I'd be uh, missing out on 200 grand if I did that. So uh, this uses very little code. And again, it's all built in our markdown. I'm going to show you the raw version. Uh, we start off with some code chunks that are there basically to work out the compound interest. Uh, and you can see we've got a series of uh, pipelines transforming stuff, uh, including uh, some things to uh, cross part of them. Creating those sliders is, uh, and these are excessively spread out, but it's just a function called slider input. 
how I tell R uh, to take those inputs is I have these reactive expressions which say, go do the coffee costs calculation with the values from the sliders. And then I split that up into some different sections. Now that I have uh, some uh, calculated data sets based on the input. So those could be going away, getting data from the database or uh, talking to an API or whatever. I then have my boxes, uh, very simple. They're just this, essentially this value box command where I have a value, a word and a font or some icon. And then I have some pots which are mostly formatting here. Uh, and so I'm able to do all of that in very few lines of code, 188 lines of code in very heavily spread out built this dashboard. I didn't have to do any JavaScript, no, C, uh, no CSS, no HTML. It's so cool. Even if you just consider this for prototyping, it's really worth picking up. Uh, uh, you can integrate in many places. So uh, it's also, a bit, it's a small executable, which makes it very portable. Um, and you can call the executable from the command line. So the R script, you can write ad hoc code against, or you can source files. So if uh, you write a batch process routine to prep some data, build some charts, to uh, resize some images, um, we even uh, have a package that sits over um, the image magic library. So if you want to be able to uh, stick dancing. Uh, I can put this on the URL. So we're able to um, process images and work with things like Professor Frick. Uh, so if you need to do image processing, uh, you can do this very effectively in R with very few lines of code and then schedule this on uh, on a cron job or on this task scheduler to be able to do um, all sorts of cool things, including making GIFs, which is what we do a lot in our, we like our GIFs and our puns. So we can call it from the command line. Uh, another quite useful tool uh, especially for us Microsoft people, is in SQL Server 2016 uh, and later we're actually able to embed R in our store procedures. So we can uh, then just write exec special custom fun special store procedure to go away and do some R processing. So uh, here is a sample script. Uh, SP execute external script is your friend. That's the uh, main workhorse. Uh, if you only have 2016, I think you can still only write R in here, but if you have 2017, you can write Python. You have a script where you can uh, write your R code. If you have a lot of R code, and you, uh, there's a package called SQL R Utils that helps make this SP execute external script statement for you. You can send it data if you want to, and then you can give an optional specification as to what your data set should look like on the way back. 
that's useful for when you're going to otherwise get some potential issues, like if the data is stored in date time or date time two, and you might not get uh, the same date type back reliably enough from your store procedure. So you can embed R to do cool things like generate graphs, build models, um, do uh, deep learning, neural nets and things like that. And you can actually have that executable as a stored procedure from your application. You can have it uh, score data to say like how likely uh, is this person to uh, leave the uh, you know, churn as the data loads up on the call center screen. So we can use this to integrate um, a whole lot of intelligence into our systems, still just do it for a SQL Server call. Uh, super handy because that's just a, a, really min a really minimal impact on your infrastructure. You can also turn R into an API. And there's a few different options here. So Plumber is kind of the new kid on the block, very well supported by RStudio. Um, and it's pretty easy to turn things into functions. OpenCPU is uh, very battle tested, uh, very easy to utilize, and has some nifty benefits like it has a JS library so that you can then actually uh, call R from inside you can call R from inside JavaScript. So if you want a uh, function, uh, if you want uh, charts and things that are generated by R, including passing things like the JSON structure for a D3 database, uh, you can do that and it will go and talk to the R executable. This is uh, really powerful, uh, useful tools for us because uh, JavaScript maths and things leaves a little bit to be desired. Other options in the Microsoft sphere, uh, Azure Machine Learning Services, uh, you don't just have to use that as a GUI to build data science models. You can build your data science models or batch processes in R and use the Azure ML package to deploy them as web services on Azure. And that's great then because it's kind of scalable in, um, in the cloud. If you want something more local, then you can use the Microsoft Machine Learning Server, which is what the old R server and the Revo Enterprise R used to be called. And you can uh, deploy APIs to that. So that's great for internal microservices. Uh, deployment looks like uh, making a connection to uh, your R server and then doing a publish service. You can either publish some code or you can also publish uh, a model object for predictions. And you can specify the schema here, um, which is always smart to do. And one of the nice things about this, when this goes and does the publish, it also generates a Swagger document, which makes consumption of the API so much easier, because you basically have that built-in documentation. So you can put R in your database, you can put R behind an API, you can call R from the command line, and you can even call R from JavaScript. That makes it eminently consumable inside almost any existing architecture, super handy. Uh, in terms of what R can process, R can process I say almost anything because somebody can always find some new arcane 
format that I've never heard of uh, and we might not process. So uh, I would highly recommend R for getting, uh, tackling some of your XML woes. So here I'm just getting uh, a sample file, reading it into R. We're able to work with children uh, and get specific child items. Uh, you can do this, uh, this a few lines of code, give us just a library um, so it doesn't have some of the memory leaks that some of the older XML processing uh, techniques have. JSON is also super easy um, so here I'm talking to the have I been pwned API and I'm just using this from JSON function and I'm able to get a data set here of um, uh, all the information. So I didn't have to do any um, complex uh, class statements um, and in order to be able to consolidate things. So it's not like writing json.net. Uh, this is much easier to get things into a table and kind of tables are usually one of the most uh, easy to work with structures. It still facilitates nested JSON. You can see here with the square brackets, uh, and we have um, a statement like a nest to split those up, or we can use our map to operate on each of these different groups. So we're able to handle uh, hierarchical data really effectively as well. Uh, with APIs, we've got pretty good API support through a package called HT. Usually you have to think about rate limiting. So uh, it's worth noting the rate limiter package. So you'll have uh, something which does your API call and you basically wrap limit rate around it to be able to apply a maximum rate. And now when we call it, it waits around instead of doing 10 calls very, very quickly. So uh, R is very good at way of doing um, data transfer. Uh, also, as well as consuming um, lots of data sources, it can actually use uh, a number of other languages as working engines. So for instance, the V8 uh, package uh, allows us to talk to this. So, um, let me show you where that went. So, here, here. so library V8, we start up our V8 engine. And then we can do things like validate, we can pass data back and forth. Um, and that means that R can use any uh, JavaScript library out there. Uh, for instance, I have uh, for an old company, I wrote a package called 
Suli, which sits over the Star Wars Laura Pixon generator JavaScript library, uh, to be able to build, to be able to uh, get text back from Star uh, that is Star Wars -y, uh, in R. And the that is I only had to write the mate, uh, somebody else wrote the JavaScript and I was just able to uh, very lightly skin over the top of it. I mean, most of this is documentation. And then this is how the code works. It's very, very simple stuff. So we're able to um, work with a JavaScript backend. We can also uh, use Python as a backend as well. Uh, and it kind of uh, mimics a bit the Python experience. So to make things available, usually start off with some import statements. And then once we've imported those, instead of doing like uh, main dot something or OS dot, we do OS dollar. So we're able to get uh, use Python functions in R. So R rocks, uh, it's such a great development tool. Uh, it helps me integrate many of the languages I use and produce websites and interactive dashboards and stuff with ease. It's greatly reduced the code burden, which makes maintenance easier. And I'm able to host up in different ways in almost every architecture that I've come across. Obviously, it's not necessarily going to work on a camera, like an Internet of Things, but with, uh, you can uh, convert models that you build to work on them. So you can put a lot anywhere. It has a lot of benefit in many, many places. And hopefully, uh, some of the things I've shown you will encourage you to go and give our a play today. So thank you all very much for listening and thank you to the data platform geeks for having me on the book and putting up with me being in between uh, bots. So this talk uh, isn't up yet. I will get it up on itsalot.com forward slash talks and I'll tweet the link out. Uh, once a month I give a book away. So if any of you are interested in uh, text analysis, uh, natural language processing. Uh, join me, uh, follow at lock data, and you're automatically entered into the draw at the end of the month. Uh, so thank you all very much. I think we have some time for questions. Yep, sure. Um, thanks, Steph, for the wonderful session and taking out your time uh, between your travel. Uh, uh, I have a few slides before you take mm -hmm. questions. So okay. uh, I request all the attendees to post your questions in the Q&A panel while I cover these slides. All right, so... Uh, so I, I just quickly try, walk, uh, want to walk you through the pre-conference training days that are available at the conference this year. Uh, we have Dimitri Kotkovic, an MCM from uh, US, uh, he, and also an MVP. He'll be doing a full day training on troubleshoot and optimize SQL Server. Sunil Agarwal is coming back this year again uh, with a pre-conference training day. He'll be uh, doing a training on how to migrate your on-prem databases to Azure SQL DB as well as managed instance. Reza Rad, a data analyst and BI expert from New Zealand and also an MVP, will be doing a full day Power BI training from Rookie to Rockstar. Dr. Leila Atati, data scientist and MVP from New Zealand. She'll be doing two pre-conferences here. Uh, her first one is uh, leading edge data science with Microsoft tools. Andrew Leonard, a world around SIS expert, is doing a full day training on day of intelligent data integration with SIS and Azure Data Factory. Madan Gajendran and his team, the Cosmos DB team, will be doing a full day workshop on Cosmos DB. The second pre-con by Dr. Leila Tati is building intelligence applications using the Microsoft AI platform. 
uh, an extension and actually a very deep dive on more uh, on what you have seen today. Uh, it's a practical R for everyone by Steph. Again, uh, a full day training, and she is a data science expert from UK and also an MVP. We have Sanjay Mishra and his team, the data cat team from Microsoft, will be doing a full day training on how to build a scalable data architecture in Azure. Joey and Denny are coming back again this year. Uh, Joey will be doing a full day pre-con on Linux for the SQL Server DBAs. Peter Myers, who has been a very popular speaker last year, is doing a full day training on zero to analysis services. And Denny is doing a high availability and disaster recovery, both on-prem and Azure. More information is available at dps10.com. And you can, if you have any questions or if you want help talking to your manager or your company, please drop us a line at contact at dps10.com or you can reach us directly on the phone numbers provided below. I will leave the panel open for questions. It looks like there are not no questions, Steph. All right. Um, I would, I would encourage if you have any further questions, you can directly reach out to Steph. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording of this webinar, also other resources which Steph will, Steph will be providing. And uh, thanks again, Steph, for taking your time to get today and doing this webinar. It was a wonderful webinar. And thanks everyone for taking your time and attending the webinar today. My pleasure. Thank you all very much. Thank you and have a great day.